I'm going to share the, oh, thank you for recording it. And I'm going to send you the link to the GitHub repository. So you have that. Um, so uh, if you are familiar with Git, feel free to clone the repo to create like a local copy on your machine. Um, otherwise, if you click on the green code button on that GitHub page, it'll allow you to download a compressed file that contains all of the most up-to-date lesson material. And Melissa already made note, note of this, but you can also export the POSIT cloud project that we'll be working on today. And since the content I believe is gonna be deleted after two weeks, um, exporting your uh, POSIT cloud project so you have a local copy of it might be of interest if you wanna um, go back to it and refer to it in the future. And in terms of like questions, um, I think I'm comfortable with people uh, raising their hand, asking, raising, a hand uh, and or asking a question in the chat. If it's um, a one-off question, uh, it may be that the other co-hosts uh, will be able to help you out. Um, and yeah, I, I guess like throughout this workshop, um, don't feel like you need to memorize everything. Um, I hope it just helps you kind of get familiar with the R syntax. And this first workshop might feel a little dry, um, but hopefully covering the fundamentals uh, will make plotting a much more enjoyable experience next week. So those that was sort of uh, my little blurb. And yeah, I think we can dive into it. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Second. Just let me know when you're able to see my browser. Looks good. Great, thanks. All right, so um, for those who are completely new to the R programming language, uh, the R programming language, or R rather, statistical computing and data analysis, and it provides a wide range of statistical and graphical techniques. So it's a very popular tool for things like data manipulation, exploration, uh, visualization, and modeling. And as with many other programming languages, you're going to have its uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, with R, um, you could argue that some of its advantages are that because it's open source, it is a free software environment that is accessible to everyone. So unlike other um, softwares, uh, you don't need to purchase a license in order to use it. And the second advantage is that it's uh, the community really that develops code enhancements and bug fixes. So the users themselves can act actively contribute towards improving the software environment. And in addition, there is also a large active community that uh, contrib contributes to its extensive collection of packages, which are sort of like plugins for the language. And we'll explore uh, packages in depth later on. Um, as for uh, disadvantages, uh, you could argue that R can be a little slower and may not handle memory uh, as efficiently as other languages. And today uh, we're going to be looking at using R and R Studio on Posit Cloud, uh, which is this interface that I have here. Hopefully, um, everyone has been able to make an account uh, if they wish to like code along. Um, and we're using Posit Cloud for a couple of reasons. So first, um, me, the person leading the workshop, and the participants only need a browser to access the IDE. So it kind of saves us a lot of uh, time from uh, telling you how to install the software and how to configure it on your local machines. And it also kind of helps us with ensuring a consistent environment across all participants and that it's much easier for me to make sure that the version of R I'm using for this workshop is the same version of R that you're going to be using. So uh, to get comfortable with this IDE, uh, which stands for Interactive Development Environment, um, which is this space that we use to write our code, uh, I'm just going to quickly explain the purpose of each of the panes. 
So to demonstrate, I'm just going to open up an R script. Right, so uh, what I have in this top left uh, corner of the screen is called the script editor. So this is the environment that we would use to write and edit our code. Uh, so for example, I can write um, a simple mathematical equation, like one plus two, and then I can execute this R code by selecting it. So I could highlight it and I can click on this run button up here. And by doing that, you can see that the results are displayed down here in what we call the console uh, in the bottom left corner of the IDE. And another way we can um, send code to the console is to place our cursor like on the line of code that we want to execute. And if you press Control Enter on Windows or Command and Enter on a Mac, that's another way to uh, quickly send the code that you want to run to your console. And then if we shift over to the right hand side, you can see uh, a few different tabs. So the environment tab uh, is going to get populated with objects and variables and their values. And um, that will define later in this workshop. So you'll see that this, um, this particular pane is going to get populated as we, as we go on. And down here, we have uh, a few more tabs. So the files tab uh, shows you the current structure uh, of, a, of the particular subdirectory. And if you switch over to plots, um, you'll see that this tab is going to be used for displaying plots. So we're, uh, we're going to get more familiar with it in the third, no, second and third workshops, uh, since we're going to be looking at using ggplot to create plots. And uh, the packages tab also allows you to handle packages and kind of gives you a quick glance at the packages that are currently installed on your machine. Okay, so that was a very quick introduction to the IDE that we'll be using today. I'm just going to switch over to the chat to see if there's any questions. Okay. Um, there's a couple of people with a Shiny Apps IO account having trouble. Um, Melissa, is this being sorted um, in the background? I think you can just go ahead and like okay. Brittany and I can monitor the questions. If there's anything like really important, we can just interrupt you and let you know. So awesome. you don't have to Sounds keep good. checking back. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, there's a question that asked uh, uh, in the chat, what does the check mark uh, in the packages mean. Basically, a check mark means that it's it's been loaded into uh, your environment. Okay, so moving on. Yeah, and I'm gonna go back to uh, this particular file. So uh, I guess now is when we're gonna start uh, really actively uh, coding. So if you really want to, if you want to code along, uh, feel free to like boot up your Posit Cloud workspace and select the lesson 01 blank file. Uh, if you wanna code along, um, I've included code chunks that you can fill in um, as we go through the workshop. Uh, otherwise, if you want to just uh, chill and like read through the code as we go along, you're more than welcome to look at the complete version of the file. And that includes all of the code chunks already populated for you. So you don't have to actively type um, along. Uh, anyway, uh, so I have opened the lesson 01 blank dot QMD file and QMD uh, starts stands for Quarto Markdown, I believe, and Quarto Sorry. And uh, Quarto is basically a file format or a publishing system that allows you to combine your R code, uh, its results, so outputs, and your narrative all into one document. And what's really cool is that it supports multiple uh, output formats, including PDFs, uh, HTML, Word files, uh, and etc. So if you're working with colleagues who are maybe like less familiar with Quarto, you have this option of uh, converting to a file format that they may be more comfortable working with. 
Uh, so the next part may not work for everyone depending on when they copied my posit cloud um, project. But for those that have um, our markdown like already installed uh, in their workspace, you can see that when you try clicking render, um, what our studio will do is that it'll generate a document that includes both the content, so like the text that you've written, uh, in addition to any output of the embedded art code chunks. And if I scroll here, I, I, I'm not seeing any code chunks right now since we haven't filled it in yet, but that's just kind of to demonstrate how uh, this QMD file that we're going to be working in can get uh, rendered and formatted nicely and be viewed uh, in the browser. Just getting rid of that file. Okay, so I think we're ready to dive in to the first topic, um, data types and variable. So data types, define the format in which data is stored and the operations that we can perform on that data. So R has uh, five basic data types. Uh, character, which is basically text enclosed in quotation marks, numeric, integer, complex, and logical. And if you're familiar with other programming languages, uh, or familiar with programming, uh, these are what we call Boolean values, which can either hold a value of true or false. So we can try assigning um, a data of type character to a variable. So um, I can write, oh, and is the um, IDE like big enough? Do you want me to zoom in a little bit more? That might be a good idea, like especially for the okay. recording. Sure. How's that? Looks good. Okay, cool. Hello world. All right. And to run this, I can press this green uh, play button, or I can also do control enter or command enter. And you can see that uh, the code that I've written has been sent to the console, so it's been executed. Oh, and to see the result of this, I can actually do that as well. Okay, so it's returning hello world. Um, right, so what I've basically done here is that I have stored a string that has the value like hello space world into a variable named car var using what's called the assignment operator. And a variable uh, such as the one that we have here, carvar, um, you can think of as containers for storing data. And in terms of um, how we create variables or how we name variables, the best practice is to use lowercase letters and underscores to make them readable. And we often want to use like descriptive names that describes the information held by the variable. And another important thing to note is that R is case sensitive. So like capital letters and or uppercase and lowercase letters um, are, aren't interchangeable. So example, I have defined carvar to be hello world, but if I were to type uppercase carvar, um, R is gonna say that, uh, that they can't find that particular object because it hasn't been defined. And in a similar way, we can try creating a numeric variable. Ten. We can run it. Oh. Okay. Something weird is happening. Give me a second. Okay. 
Okay, there we go. Okay. Hit number. Okay, so it should return 10 to the console since I assigned a value of 10 to, num uh, to numVar. We can also try creating an integer variable. So this uh, upper case L denotes that this particular number three should be interpreted as an integer. We can do that. Is anyone else having the same issue? Oh, what, uh, give me a second. Okay, hmm. weird. It seems to be fine when I like switch back and forth between source and visual, which is not great. Um, but okay. I'm just gonna keep on going. Continue. Yep. Perfect, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So I think where did we where did we leave off? Um, I don't think we heard the complex variable. I, okay. I think it cut off like midway through when you were talking about why that the L for integers, capital L. Got it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pick up at the complex variable. So I'm defining it in a similar way. I'm using this letter I to indicate an imaginary number. And similarly for the logical variable, I am assigning the value true to a variable named bool var. And scrolling down, um, I have left um, a bit of practice exercises for everyone so you can get familiar with um, different data types and assigning them to variables. So I'll give everyone maybe like a minute or two to walk through these five small exercises and as a side note, um, you can just do all of this in the same code chunk um, that I've set up here. You can just put your answers on different lines. Uh, if you would prefer to create a new code chunk for each exercise, you can also do, oh, no, you can also go to insert up here, execu executable cell R, and it'll create a new code chunk for you if, if that's easier to um, uh, organize your code that way. I think that yeah, so might give... one, one of the, like there's a the same issue that you were having with the yeah. code chunk not being recognized. There's a lot of people in the chat having the same issue. Okay. Um, so I think, do you, do you wanna just repeat like how to fix that issue either by creating a new code chunk or maybe just show how to start like a new R script if, it, if the code chunks are not working? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, so two ways that you can work around this issue. One, potentially, so uh, what I just showed earlier, um, if you kind of create uh, a new line in your quarter markdown and you go to, sorry, you go to insert executable cell R or use the shortcut mm. that's shown uh, next mm. to it, it'll create a new code chunk for you. Alternatively, if you don't want to work with this quarter markdown and you just want to get comfortable like assigning variables and you don't really care about having the narrative prose, you can create an R script and, and do the same thing here. Um, like that. So you can write R scripts. You, you can write R code in here without necessarily um, uh, without having all that narrative text, if that makes it easier for you. Rico, can I ask you real quick yes. to make me co-host? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that while I wait for um, people.
All right. Um, so I'm going to go back. So we can review these exercises together. So create a character variable with their name. Um, in my case, I might do something like name, uh, name var, or yeah, sure, name var, Draco. Okay, that is not ideal. Um, I think I might switch over to using the script as well. Just give me a second. So I'll do, I will do this. <laughs> okay, uh, creating a numeric variable um, with a decimal value. I could do something like um, decimal 0 0.2. And if I run that, you can see that um, I've created a numeric variable with a decimal value can also try creating another integer va a variable to represent a year. So maybe like year var 1995L, call year var, it's gonna return 1995, which is an integer. You can also try creating a logical variable with a value of false. And finally, I can check the data type of each variable using the class function. And how I can do that is wrap the name of the variable in uh, the class function. So for example, if I want to get the data type of carvar, I can put carvar, I highlight this and send it to the console. You can see that it's returned character because carvar uh, holds a uh, string or a data of type character. Okay. Um, any questions I need to come back to? Oh, and okay, uh, I see that there's a few unanswered questions. I think you're, you're good for now. There's some people okay. having, having uh, issues. So I'm just suggesting creating a new R script like you did. Okay. Uh, so that's just Sounds file, good. new script, R script. Okay, thanks. All right, so the next thing that we're gonna cover is data structures. And data structures are basically containers for organizing and storing data in different formats. And R has a few different data structures, and these include atomic vectors, factors, data frames, lists, and matrices. Um, but today, we're just going to look at the first three, so vectors, factors, and data frames. And I'm choosing to look at these three um, because they're going to be the most relevant uh, for creating plots in the second and third workshops. All right, so vectors are a collection of elements of the same data type. So again, uh, we can try creating some vectors to get ourselves comfortable with this uh, new concept. So uh, if I want to create a numeric vector, I am going to uh, type C and, and then open and, and close bracket. And within it, I can put in numeric elements. So that would be a numeric vector, for example. And then we can assign it to a variable, for example. So if I highlight this and send it to the console, um, I've defined a numeric 
vector and I can refer to it. And similarly, we can do the same thing for characters. Like that, I can have um, a collection of uh, fruit names um, as characters. So this would be a character vector. And then I can also assign it to uh, variable if, if I want. If I highlight it and send it to the console. If I type carvar, then I it returns the character vector that I've defined. And with vectors, we can also do some interesting things with it. Uh, for example, if we want to check the length of the vector, we can wrap the uh, variable or the numeric vector that we want to check the length for in the length function. And if I highlight this and send it to the console, Uh, it'll return five, which is the number of elements that I have in my vector. And sometimes we want to retrieve um, a specific value in a vector that we have. And we can do what's called vector index indexing to retrieve certain elements of a vector. So for example, if I want to retrieve the first value of the vector, let's say the first value of the car bar, character vector that we've defined, what I can do is type car bar and using square brackets, I'm going to put um, the index like at which I want to retrieve the value. So I want to retrieve the first value. So I'm going to put one here. And if I send this to the console, it's going to give me back Apple. Um, and as a side note, R starts counting from one, not zero, um, unlike other languages like Python. Um, and we can also retrieve multiple values of a vector. So in order to, let's say, retrieve the second and third uh, element of our character vector, once again, using square brackets, um, but this time I'm going to pass in a numeric vector specifying the positions that I want to retrieve um, the data for. So I want to retrieve the second and, let's say, third values of this character vector. So I'm going to set it up like that. I'm going to highlight it and send it to the console. And you can see that it returned grapefruit and banana, which were the second and third elements of the vector. And then scrolling down a little further, we have um, the third data structure that we're going to be taking a look at, which is called factor. And factors are used to represent categorical variables with predefined levels. So I can try creating um, a factor variable here. So let's say, for example, you are you just like performed a survey of some sort, and you want to hold you want to create a variable that holds the different um, social classes, perhaps of, of the respondents that you that you worked with. So I'm going to start um, similarly to how I created the character vector, and let's say um, I have like five respondents. The first one responded upper, the second one responded middle, the third responded lower, the fourth responded upper, and maybe the fifth responded middle as well. I'm just going to expand that a bit. So this looks like a, a character factor, something that we've seen before. But this time, I am going to wrap that in a factor. So. So I'm wrapping this entire thing in factor. And I'm also just going to assign it to a variable, maybe called social class. I'll run this so that it's assigned uh, this factor to a variable named social class. And when I look at social class, you can see that it returns not only the values, so upper, middle, lower, upper, and middle, but uh, 
the, the predefined levels. We're basically only allowing it to have the value lower, middle, or upper, unlike what we saw in character. And I'm introducing um, the factor data structure here since uh, using factors allow us to do things like arranging bar graphs in the desired order and uh, just makes it easier for us to work with different data types when we're plotting next week using ggplot2. Okay. And finally, um, the last data structure that we'll cover today, data frames. So these are basically a collection of vectors, which we just saw earlier, that all have the same length and each column can contain a different data type. Um, and it's often used to represent tabular data. So we can quickly uh, try creating a data frame here. So maybe we want to create some sort of tabular data that holds a person's name and age. So I'll start by using the data frame function. I'm gonna press enter and I want my first column, my first vector to hold um, an array of names. Maybe we have Alice, maybe we have Bob, and maybe we have Charlie. So you can see that name is a character vector. And then maybe we also want to have another column to hold the age, the different ages of these individuals. So I'll create a numeric vector that specifies the age of each person. So maybe Alice is 25, Bob is 30, and Charlie is 38. And as I've done with everything else, um, I am gonna store it in a variable named df going to highlight it and highlight all, th all four lines, send it to the console so that when I call EF, the name of my data frame, uh, you can see that it, it's, it's returned it in like a tabular structure instead of um, uh, like a list running from left to right, as we've seen with the other vectors. Okay, I'm just going to stop here for a little bit. How are we doing in the chat? Is there a particular thing that needs to be covered in maybe more detail? Um, one question that's been really common has been sure. uh, about um, lines that have the assignment operator versus lines that don't have the assignment operator. So how can you view the contents of a variable? And is it normal on lines that have the assignment operator to see no output in the console? Uh, yeah, so I think with the last part, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, when you, so when you perform, let, let's say like an assignment. So if you type out an assignment like that, and then you press enter, you are not going to see an output. All it's, all R is doing is assigning the value of hello world to a variable that you've called car bar under the hood. So you're not going to be able to see um, what's the value, what, what car bar is holding, unless like you explicitly type car bar and then it'll return the value that you assigned it earlier. And what was the, what was the other? Nope, that's perfect. Exactly that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Okay, so I think I am going to move on. All right, so uh, the next thing that we will look at today um, are operators. So R has three different types of operators. Uh, we'll go through them one by one. The first uh, is called arith arithmetic operator. So you're probably more or less familiar with them, but we'll learn how to work with these in R. And what arithmetic operators do is that they take two objects and they, pour, they perform some sort of calculation on them. So for example, if you want to add 10 and five, five, you 
kind of write it as you normally would uh, when you're like writing math equations. If you want to subtract seven from 15, oops, you might do that. Uh, if you want to multiply four by six, so the multiplication operator is the star or the asterisk. Maybe you want to uh, perform some division. And to divide, you're going to use the uh, backslash. And uh, another arithmetic operator that R has that we might not use in day-to-day -day life is called the um, modulus operator. And it basically returns the remainder after dividing one number uh, by another. So if we want to calculate 17 mod 5, or in other words, uh, return the remainder after dividing 17 by 5, we can type 17, uh, two percentage signs, 5, and it'll return 2 since that's the remainder that you get uh, once you try dividing 17 by 5. Um, another arithmetic operator that you might find useful in R uh, is the um, exponential uh, operator. So for example, if you want to try raising three to the power of two, there's two different ways you can do it. I'm just gonna, there you, go. uh, you can either do three uh, two asterisks or three hat two, and both of these will give you back the same answer. You can see they both return nine. Okay, the second family of operators that R has are called relational operators. And basically what relational operators do is that they compare two objects and it either returns true or false. So it's always gonna return a, a Boolean data type that we saw earlier. So for example, we can check that 10 is equal to 10 by writing. So notice here that I'm typing two equal signs instead of one. So by typing two equal signs, I'm checking that the value on the left-hand side and the right-hand side are equal to one another. And I expect this to return true. And if I look in the console, I see that it's returned true. Uh, conversely, we can check that one number is not equal to another. So if you want to check that five is not equal to seven, we can do that. So I have see here that I've replaced one equal sign with an exclamation mark. And the exclamation mark and the equal sign together, that allows you to evaluate whether or not um, the number on the left-hand side and the right-hand side are not equal. And since five isn't equal to seven, I expect this to return true. And again, it returns true. Um, R allows you to check uh, for greater than, less than, greater than, or equal to, and so on, like these um, operations that you know we have used before in daily life. And in R, we would just type this out as, so if you want to check whether eight is greater than five, we can write eight greater than five, very similar to how we would like write it by hand. Uh, I'm just going to skip this one and uh, do this one instead. So if you want to check that three is greater than or equal to four, we can do this. That's the greater than or equal to sign. And since this statement isn't true, I expect it to return false. And okay, it did that, cool. So uh, the last set of operators that I wanna cover are called logical operators. And these are operators that act on logical values. So I wanna first check that uh, to see if the statement is true. Like five is greater than three and seven is less than 10. Since uh, the statements on like both sides of the and are true, I expect this to return 
True. And how we would write this in R is, so I want to make sure that I'm putting each statement like on either side of the and in its own parentheses. So first I want to check whether or not five is greater than three. And I'm going to uh, use the ampersand to replace the and. And seven is less than 10. So by using this and symbol, it's only going to return true if both equations, like on both sides of the symbol, are true. And since that's uh, what it is in this case, it returns true. Um, another operator that uh, is worth introducing here is the OR operator. So OR uh, returns true provided that one side uh, is true. So what I mean by this is if I want to check whether 4 is greater than 6 or 9 is equal to 9, I can write it as so. So I'm just kind of combining it with the logical operators, operators that we saw earlier. So even though 4 is not greater than 6, and this side of the equation would um, uh, would equate to false. Since 9 is equal to 9, and this side of the equation uh, would evaluate to true, all of this is going to evaluate to true. And that's what we see in the console as well. And the third uh, logical operator that might be uh, useful to us is the not. So not basically negates or flips uh, whatever Boolean data that you have. So for example, uh, we can see that not true operates the false. So uh, it, this part may have been a little dry, but knowing these uh, logical operators and relational operators are really helpful when it comes to uh, filtering data based on certain like inclusion or exclusion criteria later on, um, especially like prior to plotting if you're only trying to plot like a certain subset of your data. All right, so we have a little bit of time to cover some basic functions. So I think we'll do that. Uh, so functions in R are basically blocks of code that are designed to perform specific tasks. And throughout this workshop, we've already seen a couple of them, one being class that we use to check um, what class a particular variable belong to, and the other one being length that we use to check the length of the character and numeric vectors that we've defined. And with most functions, they accept some sort of input, it'll process them or it'll perform some, some sort of computation under the hood, and then it'll often return outputs for you to use. And I'm just gonna cover some of R's basic uh, statistical functions. So uh, we can start by calculating the mean or average of a numeric vector. So I'm just gonna first define a variable called numbers that's gonna hold some a set of numbers that we can perform all these um, statistical calculations on. So like, feel free to put in, I don't know, five, six uh, numbers of your choice. That's what I'm just going to, that's what I'm doing here. And I'm going to send that to the console. Okay, so numbers is fine, great. So if I want to calculate uh, the mean or average of a numerical vector, which like this is what I have here. I can use the mean function. And that'll give me the mean uh, of the numbers here. And I can also calculate the median middle value uh, in the same way. Unfortunately, I think it might be the same as the mean. So not too exciting there, uh, but the median function is there for you as well. We can also uh, quickly calculate the sum of values in a numeric vector. So we don't have to type like 5 plus 8 plus 12 plus 15 and so on. Uh, and that we can do by calling the sum function. And again, passing our variable numbers as a variable, uh, as an input into the function. And we can also calculate the minimum 
and maximum values of uh, this numeric vector. If I want to calculate the minimum, I'll use the min function. And if I want to calculate the maximum, I'll use the max function. And even though like visually it's very uh, easy to inspect what the minimum and maximum here, you can see that if you have like a very long uh, vector that is not sorted, uh, these two functions may be really helpful in figuring out what the minimum and the maximum values are. So unfortunately, uh, due to the time, I think I'm just going to leave these practice exercises for the participants and just skip to the next section, uh, which are pipes. So uh, to start talking about pipes, I think what I'm first, yeah, what I'm going to do is try uh, this computation that I've set up for myself here. So I want to try computing the sum of every number from 1 to 10, take its square root, and then round that to three decimal places. So I can, oops, I'll start by um, computing the sum of every number from 1 to 10. And using the col uh, colon there basically allows me to generate uh, every uh, number from 1 to 10. So it's like a shorthand. So that allows me to calculate the sum. Great. Now I'm going to take its square root by using a square root function. making sure I close the brackets. And then I'm going to round this number to three decimal places using the round function. Again, paying attention to my brackets. So that is what I would have to write in order to perform that computation. But I kind of think that's difficult to read since, you know, the operations aren't really flowing from left to right and the sequence of actions, they're not really presented in a clear way. So to deal with situations like this, R has uh, what's called a pipe. And this is something that allows you to chain together operations in a more fluid and readable way. So I can rewrite what I have here using the pipe like this. Um, so to um, get the pipe, you can either press Control, Shift, and M, or Command, Shift, and M, or you can use the, um, the bar followed by the greater than sign. So I am going to first uh, like create every number from 1 to 10. Then I'm going to take its sum by basically passing this into the sum function. And then I am going to create another pipe and pass the, uh, the summed numbers into the square root function. And then I'm going to take that square root uh, square, square rooted number into the round function, making sure I round to three decimal places. And I do that by um, uh, specifying or setting the value of the digit argument to three. And you can see that I've gotten the exact same number. However, I think one is a lot easier to read than the other. And you'll see that when we're like filtering data and we're passing in, uh, we're working with data that's going from one form to another and so on um, before we plot it. Uh, we're going to be using a lot of pipes to handle some of that data wrangling so that we can get these um, operations uh, in a more readable and fluid way. And it reduces nesting, which is unfortunately what we have up here. Okay, so I think I might stop here um, since the only thing I have left to talk about are packages and we can do that next time. I'm wondering if there are any other uh, questions that you know the, the co-host kind of saw repeatedly come up that I could try clarifying while we still have three minutes on the line.
Um, there was just one question about uh, the pipe operator and like how it mm -hmm. used to have the percent symbols and now it has yeah. the, yeah. Okay, sure. I can, I can take a, a stab at that. So someone mentioned that, yeah, uh, pipes used to look a little more like this back in the day. So I could actually replace all my pipes here and it'll, okay, no, that's not going to work because I don't have the right packages. Um, but basically this old pipe that looks like this, I used to be, or it is part of a specific package called Magret R. So in order for, so in order to use the pipe, users had to install that or install and load that package into their workspace um, in order to kind of uh, have access to the pipe operator. But since I guess the um, developers of R, base R, noticed that pipes have become like this really important es essential component of the language, they've created um, this version that uses the bar and the greater than sign and included it in base R. So when you install and start using base R without you having to load any additional packages, it, it gives you the ability to perform um, that, that piping with less what we call like redundancies. Um, I hope that answered your question. Uh, so percent, uh, is this under the tidyverse package? I think Magret R is under tidyverse. So if I were to load tidyverse using, okay, I don't have tidyverse, weird. Okay, so if I were to load this, that should work. That works now. So basically b before the introduction of the base R pipe, you, you have to do that. You have to make the Magger R um, package like available in your environment uh, in order to access that piping mechanism. And I don't think one is necessarily considered better than the other for like the average um, R user. Obviously the base R pipe has its perks and that you don't need to install additional things. Um, but I believe the Magger R pipe does allow you to have a bit more control as to how the data gets passed from one step to another. Um, and yeah, I see that we're out of time. Um, I am more than okay staying on the line for like five extra minutes answering questions. Not sure if any of the other co-hosts have to go though. We're currently getting booted out of our room. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll find another spot to camp out so I can hang out with you for follow-up questions. Sure. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah just start answering some of the questions that I'm seeing in the meeting chat. Okay, it's mostly thank you. <laughs> Uh, were you copying pasting to the console or is there a shortcut to highlight and send to the console? Uh, yeah, so uh, there I, I was highlighting, but let's say that I want to uh, run line 47, like I want to send this particular piece of code to the console, then instead of highlighting and clicking run, I can just place my um, cursor uh, on it. And then if I press control enter, it'll just send that particular line of code to the console. And the shortcut for the pipe is, I'm going to write it here. It's either, it's command or control shift M, uh, depending on whether you're on a Mac or a Windows.
the next session, um, I believe Melissa has posted links to our meetup events somewhere in this chat. Let's see. Oh, okay, got it. Um, yeah, I I hope that we're going to be able to share the recording um, on the Our Ladies Global YouTube channel. It might be a little difficult since um, I unfortunately, my computer crashed midway and the recording got split into two. Um, but if you are interested in looking at some of the other Our Ladies Global chapters um, recordings, you can find that um, on their YouTube channel if you just type Our Ladies Global. Okay, um, I think the questions have calmed down a bit. So I think we'll leave it here. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in and thank you for being patient while my computer crashed and I had to sign back into the meeting. Um, I hope that we'll see you at the next two sessions and we'll try or I'll try to get the um, quarter markdown issue figured out so that we don't have to Bounce around. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.